Hey, I'm Elia Einhorn. Welcome to the TalkHouse podcast. Today I'm joined by... Nick Dawson, Editor-in-Chief of TalkHouse Film. Nick, I am very, very excited about today's episode, which features Grammy-winning producer Ian Brennan in conversation with TV on the radio's Tunde Adebimpe, who I believe you've had a run-in with. I have. It's like I, I, it's very cool for me to be on a, on a non-film-centric podcast, but I do have a little bit of Tunde knowledge. Of course, he's somebody who bridges the worlds of music and film. And... Uh, Actor slash musician. Actor slash musician slash general good guy. But um, yeah, when, when I was a, a young uh, journalist back in the UK, in probably 2000, 2001, I interviewed this guy called Joel Hopkins who made a film called Jump Tomorrow. And this very handsome man was the lead. His name was Tunde as well. And, and I ended up interviewing him and Joel uh, at a film festival in my hometown in Edinburgh. And... Um, I just, you know, kind of hung out with those guys and talked for like half an hour, an hour. And Tunde was just this guy who had never acted before, but like he'd been an animation uh, major at film school with Joel and he was a very sweet guy. And, and then when I moved to New York, like six, seven years later, TV on the radio were the biggest band in town. They're still, you know, one of the biggest bands in town. And, and it was just really cool to be like, wait, wait a minute. Like, holy shit, this guy who I just hung out with years back is now like not only a star, but just like in this band that were so exciting. And I, 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 you know, I've seen them live since and really follow their, their records and, and love the band. And it's really cool to listen to this and to, to hear that he's kind of the same really, really lovely down to earth guy. I, I love that story. And, and of course, Tunde is still acting. He was in Jonathan Demi's Rachel Getting Married acting alongside Anne Hathaway. And he's been in a, in a couple of movies that uh, TalkHouse Film contributors have, have made. Bob Byington and Sebastian Silva have both made movies with him. We were talking earlier about, about Nasty Baby, which is a kind of a crazy movie that he's one of the leads in, which is, it's crazy, but it's crazy good. And you should go in knowing as little as possible about that. He also has a line in the new Spider-Man Homecoming movie playing Mr. Cobwell. Uh, Mr. Cobwell is amazing as well, of course. But this podcast, is, I don't want to derail it. Like, this, is, this is not about Mr. Cobwell, it's not about Tunde. It's really about this record, which I know you really, really love. It is, it is. Now, Ian Brennan has made his name helping get music that otherwise probably wouldn't be recorded, definitely not released in any major way out into the world. Um, in, in this conversation, you're going to hear about a few of the projects he's worked on. He and Tunde got to know each other while working on the Tenari Wen record that went on to win the Grammy. Um, that, that's a, the Tuareg group founded by Ibrahim Ag Al-Habib, Rebel Fighters who made that record Tassili with Brennan at the helm and uh, a couple members of TV on the radio. Tunde sings on it and also plays. Let's check out a clip from that record featuring Tunde. <laughs> Really beautiful stuff, very virtuosic musicianship. Another project that we're going to hear about are the Malawi Mice Boys. These are gospel singers from Malawi who got their name because they, they literally sell mice as snacks along the highway. Where are they sort of anesthetized mice or dead mice or... From the pictures, they seem to be dead mice um, caught good. earlier that day, actually, and, and in very dangerous conditions. Gorgeous gospel singers. Check this out. <laughs> Again, very powerful stuff, not mainstream as far as Western listeners. Now, the project that brought them together for this conversation is the Tanzanian Albinism Collective record, White African Power. It just came out this summer. It's absolutely become one of my favorite records of the year. It's so honest. It's so emotional. These are field recordings. It's, it's, these are not sophisticated recordings. Um, it's quite rough, but the songs are just beautiful. And the way they were written is Ian Brennan, 
flies out to Tanzania and takes a four and a half hour ferry ride out to Ukarewe Island. Where there's a, an albino colony with people there who, who have eventually, effectively been banished. Right, in, in much of East Africa, albinos are persecuted. Um, some have been murdered. Many have been raped. Many are abused and thrown out of their village. You'll hear a couple of those stories in this podcast, although they don't, they don't dwell on that here. This record celebrates their strength and also memorializes the pain that they've experienced. So, so Nick, these are people who, for the most part, had never played musical instruments, really had never written songs in their villages. Most were not allowed to sing in church. So it's in a way, this is kind of a chance for them to express themselves in a way they never have before. It really is. And the song titles alone tell, tell this powerful story. Uh, here's a few of them. They gossiped when I was born. I am a human being. An- another one here. Who can we run to? Life is hard. This is really deeply honest from the heart songwriting with no pretense, no idea that it's going to bring them fame or money. And that's what this conversation really focuses on. How as listeners and as consumers, so many of our choices are dictated by industries that care nothing about this type of music. And instead give us, for example, Celine Dion. (laughs) There is a fantastic Celine Dion story here. There's also some pretty strong takedowns of other Canadian artists. Justin Bieber and Drake. So, you know, look out for that. They go under the bus. <laughs> Should we run the tape? Let's run it. This is Ian Brennan, and I'm here with the wonderful Tunde Adebempe. Hello. I was actually trying to think of the first time that we met, and I can't, it's, you know, like with, as is the case with a lot of my good friends, like I my memory of it is super vague, but I, I know it was through Kip. And I think it's when Kip was doing his Rain Machine stuff. Right. I think it was actually a Coach- Which was- Coachella physically was maybe the first time. Oh, right. Yeah. I don't mean to sound jet set or anything, but one thing that I realize is that you're probably one of the only people in the world that I've met with on four different continents. So uh, Europe, America, Europe more than once, America obviously a lot, and Africa and Uh Asia. So I guess we have to do Australia and probably not Antarctica (laughs) and South America at some point. Absolutely. I'm totally down. Yeah, I definitely remember seeing Tina Ruin at Coachella and, and being flabbergasted, like completely just like annihilated. Yeah. By by what was going on. Yeah. And and I do remember being yeah, in the trailer and talking afterwards and being very quiet because I was just like, I don't believe that I'm in the room with all of these people and everyone's so cool and everyone's so amazing and <laughs> they were amazing that day. Yeah. You know, they were really, really on in at, at that performance. But um as they mm-hmm. as they are other times too, but but particularly I think that was a that was a strong day. Yeah, and it made Coachella, you know, it was one of those things where we'd been touring for forever. Well, and I yeah. was not having a great time at Coachella until I saw the band. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, it, it, it's nice when they branch out. And I and I think it's harder, and in their defense, it's probably harder and harder for them to do that sometimes. But, uh, oh, I, sure. I, you know, yeah. obviously it's my thing usually is I really, really like to see when cultures that are otherwise ignored and languages that are otherwise ignored or included because that's even even rarer and even more incredible and also you can kind of define it better you know as opposed to saying ah oh, this band should you know more people should listen to this person or that person you know a lot of times uh, the differences are fairly slim other than maybe one just less popular doing basically the same thing but you know when you're talking about artists from Burma or, you know, from, from places that just otherwise don't get a fair shot usually compared to London and New York and, and Los Angeles and a lot of the rest of the English speaking world. Um, I think that's always a really good thing. I, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to find fault with it. No, absolutely. It's especially in the, you know, the sort of the, like you're saying, just like what, what's happening at, um, you know, at, at, festivals in this in this sort of rock I guess at that time too it was very much a rock a rock circuit or indie rock or alternative whatever circuit. I don't know, just the idea of uh 
bringing bringing groups that otherwise you know like for for whatever reasons geographical or like cultural like slip under the radar you know on a, on a global level bringing that to the front is so needed and just like enriches everyone who you know like if you you wander you wander in to see whatever some some band you heard on kcrw and you walk away realizing that there are other countries and continents yeah. and, and musics yeah just a few yeah just a few and, uh, just around 200 you're the small one <laughs> <laughs> speaking about you know other places before we branch into anything else i'm curious What's some music that you've heard from outside kind of the epicenters, you know, the normal kind of predictable places that, that has caught your attention? If any, I mean, it's sometimes hard to find, but, but what, what are some things that you've heard lately that you would want to hit people to? There's a record that I listen to a lot, you know, like a lot, a lot um, by uh, the band Super Owns. Uh-huh. I found out about them through um, Abdallah from Tina Ruen. Oh, okay. They're, I believe, also from uh, from Mali, but they're an old. Uh, it's a it's a, a Grio Grio band, right? The first time I heard it was Abdullah was playing a tape from his truck when we were in the desert in Algeria, and you know it's just completely grimy. Uh, it it just it sounded like two or three huge three stringed electric guitars just basically throwing themselves at each other and bouncing off of each other and right. and uh with with just a a very you know like a, a really thunderous drum kicking behind it and it sounded to me like some of the most futuristic you know like noise that I'd, I'd ever heard and just I was asking him I was like well, what is this what is that you know and he said oh this is you know we we danced to this when we were teenagers and I it really it had the same feeling of you know, hearing like a a really good basement show or something like it had the same. You know, it was obviously way more yeah. in um, feeling wise uh, sophisticated and coming from a definite uh, a very a very different place, but just the same immediacy of how uh, how bare bones right. everything was and how just excite. You know, like there's some things you can't really you can't define the excitement you feel about certain sounds. I don't know. It made me think a lot about about the the electric guitar. I just loved how um, just really really distorted and immediate and primal the just the foundation of that music was. And then to to also realize that you had um, like griots telling like, personal stories or stories of the tribe or stories of people in the area over this, and um, realizing that that music also had community function. I still I I love the there's a really grounding feeling I get from listening to that particular uh, record. It's super owns and the record is, I think it's Adarniba. And it must be really hard to find outside of. I asked, I was like, well, where else can I find this? And this, this kind of music. And when we went into um, Gen A and, you know, going to those kiosks that had the mixed CDs and tapes and everything, and you're just kind of, you can go digging as long as you want, you know, <laughs> like maybe you'll find something, yeah. maybe you won't, but you, right. you find a million other great things, but it, it really, yeah, I was surprised. Actually, I tracked it down and there was some, um, I'll look it up. I think it was a, maybe a, a French uh, label, a small French label that put it out. That's incredible that something was not only is futuristic and now and based in tradition, but then to find out that the music itself was actually recorded before you know like not even today mm -hmm. at the time makes it even more amazing but Janae is the 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 smaller town i think it's ten thousand people that we flew into to do the tenero on record together um and it we were fortunate we were there in november of 2010 and and the arab spring started just right after the beginning of 2016 and that area was heavily heavily hit so to be there and it's such a beautiful place physically and 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 the people were so great and one thing i remember is that every cafe we went to in Janae would be playing Tenerowan and i never could figure out if they were doing that all the time or just because we were there you know and they Everyone is in and they knew i mean it's just such a big world and there's there's so many opinions and and so much music and culture and and i think it just tends to get oversimplified a lot um 
you know, and, and it's, it's a lot more complex. I think what, what people hear and how they hear it and whether something resonates with an individual or not, it's way beyond certainly genres and, and um, you know, the pigeonholing that, that tends to take place in the marketplace. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Can I ask so, you, because I've never, just like, because uh, I've never actually asked you this, but what was the, the impetus for you to want to, um, you know, to travel and, and find musicians to, um, just, just to, to record and, and, and put out? Like, when, when did you just stop and think, like, Oh, I can do this, and I'm gonna do it because I because I have I have to do it. It's it's, it's part of what I want to do with my life. Yeah, I mean, I don't think I ever stopped and thought. It just kind of happened. Um, but it was an outgrowth of just the general frustration um, that I already was feeling as a as a teenager. You know, a guy that loved music and played guitar from the time I was five or six, and desperately wanted to never have to do anything else to somehow find a way to survive, not to be rich or famous, but just to survive. And, and, and I always thought that what mattered was, was to contribute. So in other words, everybody's going to be anonymous. Fame is, is an illusion, but if, you know, if you could contribute to the culture positively in some way, that's what I always thought was cool. So I never really cared about authorship. Mm -hmm. And in the process I made these horrible, 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 horrible records, like horrible, you know? Mm-hmm. But I did it long enough that I kind of figured out how to make records that weren't as horrible and in a certain way okay. by, by figuring out what I did wrong. And and I used to do a free show in a laundromat in San Francisco, and I felt like it was my duty to record bands that I didn't necessarily like personally to kind of figure out what might be good about them, to be more objective. And so... Recording in a laundromat, I figured out that I could record anywhere. Um, and then when Marlena and I, my wife, went to Rwanda with her mother, who's Rwandan, for the first time since the genocide that she had been back, her mother, um, we said, well, let's look for music. And every project's been different because we've had to record on a variety of equipment. You know, sometimes really doing it on the fly. But it's gotten easier and maybe sonically a little bit better with each project but I, I don't really care about the Sonics ultimately. I want them to be as good as possible, but I just care about the emotion and capturing things that, that I think are original. And, and a lot of those things I know, they're non-commercial, but also I don't expect other people necessarily to like them. But I, I objectively feel like they have a reason to exist because, like you're explaining with this amazing record that you love, that it it's almost impossible to find. And, and so many places in the world, it's almost impossible to find a single release. And even big countries, if somebody even cares about music and you ask them about a country like Brazil, you know, with over 200 million people, people Mm -hmm. might say Gilberto Gil and and, and they might not be able to get past that. You know, that might be the only artist they can name. And that's somebody who cares and knows about music or or India. They'll say Ravi Shankar, you know. So I mean it's it's weird, you know. It's it's Absolutely. So we've been lucky enough to do, you know, projects in Rwanda and Malawi and to go on from there. So that's a long long answer, but 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 uh, basically it's just been my honor to meet folks and it's just such a thrill. I think it's like the bin search for a record but but on steroids to 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 not find the record but actually record something, you know, that otherwise maybe would not ever be recorded or maybe wouldn't have even existed because I certainly try to get people to to write songs or to share songs that they're afraid to share. And oftentimes the songs people are most afraid to share are their best songs. Mm-hmm. That's why they're so afraid, <laughs> you know, because, because kind oh, of, absolutely. if they admit how good that song is, they'd have, they have to admit also how the rest of their songs aren't as good, kind of suck, you know? And they stand up to those, yeah, exactly. <laughs> in, in contrast. Yeah. Does that answer Oh all. no! Like that totally, totally answers it. Cool. Um, I I really believe in anti-recording contracts. People being paid to stop making records. <laughs> you know, <laughs> seriously, and 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 retroactive recording contracts that people should be paid to unrelease music, unclog the system. <laughs> you know, <laughs> right? Clear some space. Clear some space for the rest of the world. Yeah, yeah. I mean, a hundred thousand releases a year in America, yet 
most countries in the world, you cannot find a single well-distributed, well-promoted release from in popular music. And, and that, that's just criminal. It's not, it's not democratic. And it's not for lack of talent. Um, it's, it's, it's simply, you know, a capitalistic construct. It's just a system that, that has been built and, and has grown and has become so monolithic. And, and they've learned, the, the corporations, that the best system for them, the, le- the least risk and the most profit, is to make as much money as possible off as few people as possible. Versus the old system mm-hmm. where they would try, you know, throw a bunch of bands at the wall and hope that one sticks out of 20 and that one would <laughs> pay for the rest. Now they figured out, no, we'll just, we'll just, you know, we'll take someone, we'll, we'll, we'll prematurely, you know, coronate them and then we will blast them through every system in the world, fashion, yeah. you know, acting, uh, you yeah. know. Uh, as quickly as possible <laughs> before people, you know, blink. Yeah, it's incredible. <laughs> and look at the, look at the next thing, yeah. Which is, I think people yeah. that write, write great one-hit songs yeah. should be cherished for that and, you know, should be able to to live comfortably the rest of their lives, have rent, have food, to not ever do another song that sounds like that song but not as good. Yeah, exactly. You know, I think that the system just doesn't get people the choices and options to make better choices because they just don't know what exists. They don't even know what's out there. They don't have an opportunity. And, and I think that a, a part, a, a kind of a fault of the system a little bit is when people love music deeply and art, like, like I do and you do and most musicians and people involved in the arts do, then yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll make our way through the thicket and, 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 you know, we'll search for stuff and we'll, we'll try to find that, 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 you know, that needle in the haystack. But most people just don't have time and energy or even inclination for that. So what do they end up with? They end up with Justin Timberlake, you know, they end up with uh, Katy Perry and yeah, whatever's on the radio on the way to know, work. Yeah, 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 and and it's it is a soft science, and you can't say for sure, but but I I think like people with popular culture trivialize it too much. Like people would laugh someone out of a room if they tried to say that a romance novel was equivalent to Shakespeare. Um, that that would just, I mean, no one would take that seriously. They, if you said yeah. that Porky's was equivalent to The Godfather, no, nobody would, or a Fellini movie, no, nobody would accept that. Um, but with pop music, people do this shit all the time. And it's like, no, Nina Simone is better for you neurologically than Lady Gaga, period. So, yeah, long term effects, probably, yes. <laughs> <laughs> long-term neurological effects. <laughs> you know, it's like junk food. I mean, you can eat it and, and you might live to be 60, 70, 80. But, you know, if you eat other things, we can measure that they're more beneficial. And it doesn't guarantee you anything, but it's better for you. You're probably going to feel better. Um, I don't know. You know, but but that, that that's part of the thing that I'm always concerned at. Yeah. About. And you were about to, but you were about to talk about the the Albinism Collective Project. Yeah, we can talk about that. Yeah, we went to Ukarewe Island. We did the project with the people in the Albinism community there, and it's they are inarguably one of the most persecuted people on the planet Earth. And with all the bad stuff that happens in the world, I think it's it's really really nonetheless uh, severe when somebody is hunted and abducted and mutilated and tortured and raped and, you know, the things that happen too frequently, you know, not certainly to everybody, but to a lot, a lot of the folks there. And um, I found just in meeting them and knowing them that the daily menace is, is almost, I would think, I can't speak on anybody else's behalf, but I think would almost be worse. The level of ostracization, like one guy in the collective, Elias, is denied drinking water in the village he was born in and that he lives in. Hmm. So, you know, already it's hard to get clean water. And then the clean water that's sure. there, he's denied. Just because because he's an albino. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Mm. 
The people that we've worked with, Marlena and I, in a lot of different countries, many of them live rurally. Many of them live in quite impoverished conditions without electricity, without running water. People like the Malawi Mouse Boys and the good ones from Rwanda. Some of them are illiterate, but some of them are the greatest poets I've ever met. And what I found is that I think part of it, beyond the fact that they're just really gifted human beings, but beyond that is I think that because of the lack of instruments, like many of them don't own instruments, because of not being literate, they really have to distill everything in their heads. By the time they get to an instrument, by the time it comes out, it's so fully formed. It's kind of like a process of elimination. Yeah. Uh, the bad stuff isn't strong enough to kind of hang in there uh, in their memory. And, and the stuff that comes out is just, it's just mm-hmm. you know, ineffable sometimes, you know, how, how beautiful and effortless it is seemingly. If you're not shooting blanks into Pro Tools, you know, and <laughs> erasing it, just the idea of like, if you don't have anything to say, then it's fine to just stay quiet and think until, until you do and not, not have it be, you know, just more more chatter or noise because you know in a, in in a situation like that in those communities like no you don't you don't start singing or playing a song unless it's a thought a complete thought or you know like something that's that's formed already you know cuz cuz why why do it otherwise yeah yeah i mean i've had people you know after the bands have had some success and and people will contact them or try to find them and which I think is really disrespectful. Like, like I, I, you know, I always look at it like, would you, would, would you show up, you know, uh, on Iggy Pop's doorstep and expect him to want to jam with you, but you feel like you can just drive into some village and and the folks are supposed to be there for you because you from America or England have now heard of them. But people will say, oh, I want to go jam, mm-hmm. jam with them. And it's like, well, but they don't want to jam with you because they, you know, and it's nothing personal. It's just like they got other shit to do, you know, and, and, uh, and you know, maybe they do, maybe they don't. But uh, I think the expectation that, they, that, that it's just like this hobby. The other uh, ones hanging out and jamming. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just hanging out and jamming in between like, you know making your own crops every day and hauling your water a couple of miles and all that that stuff. But, I mean, with the Tanzanian guys, the Tanzanian Albinism Collective, they're coming to WOMAD um, next week, which is the 35th annual WOMAD, Peter Gabriel's International Music Festival. And I have no idea what the performance is going to be like. They've never been on a stage before. And it's just so hard for most people in the music world to understand that, like, like they just don't get it. It's like, yeah. well, where do they gig at home? Well, they don't gig at home, and and you know, and they think it's a lot of times they think it's hyperbole, that, you know, that I'm making this up or or something. And it's like, no, this is this is real. Like 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 they, these are, were non musicians, but their voices are so true. And I found that usually these folks in these situations rise to the occasion. You know, like they don't need to to watch videos of of, you know, James Brown or Elvis Presley or, or Frank Sinatra or whoever to get it. They, they find it in themselves. And, and, you know, I think they give respect to the audience, but they're working from a much more internal place. And so I don't know what's going to happen next week, but I, I just know how difficult it is for them, just even the logistics of it. You know, oh, these, sure. the, entire, the entire collective's never been outside of Tanzania before, Many of them have never been off the island, which is a four-plus-hour ferry ride. Um, none of them had a passport. None of them have been on a plane before. Um, and, and, you know, Tanzania is bigger than Texas. It has a population uh, bigger than Canada. Um, and, again, that's that representation thing is that, you know, this year at the Grammys, two out of five Grammy nominees were from Canada, which has a smaller population than Tanzania. Tanzania in 60 years has never had one Grammy nomination. You know, so... Canada gives us, you know, two out of the five, Justin Bieber and Drake, which, you know, I think we should build a wall, but we should build it to the north. I mean, you know, it's like, you know, I mean, I mean, you know, when, you, when you're looking at that, but, you know, I, I don't know. It's, we'll see what happens for them. But, but I, I, I think what they've accomplished already is, is just incredible. You know, I mean, I've been playing guitar my whole life and, and it's not about virtuosity. It's about the spirit of it. And, and and mm-hmm. how able they are to reveal themselves, you know, um, and and, yeah. and on such a on such a deep level. No, absolutely, and that's really exciting, you know. Just talking about you know 
never never having been in that sort of forum before, like in that mode of performance, it's exciting. It's it's always exciting to me when you don't know what's going to happen, but you but you're well aware of like the the possibility considering the people involved and the talent involved. And, you know, that's, I'm, I'm really excited. I wish I could be there. <laughs> I, I, w- I, I wish you could be there too, you know? And, and the funny thing is, is people will say, you know, like when Malawi Mouse Boys came to America, it was incredible that they could come because, you know, monetarily it makes no sense. I mean, we're losing mm-hmm. thousands of dollars bringing Tanzania Albinism Collective to America because of all the visa costs and, we're losing thousands of dollars bringing the Khmer Rouge survivors to also this year from Cambodia. And, it, it, you know, and, and so the Malay Mouse Boys got to go to America just because this festival, Hardly Strictly Bluegrass, was kind enough to pay them enough money for them to come to America. And, and, and they did. And, and uh, you know, I was trying to get folks in San Francisco where I'm from to come see them. And people were like, oh, well, I'll catch them next time they're in town. It's like, there's going to be no next time, you know, like, like I, I hope there yeah. is, I hope there will be, but, but realistically uh, it, it's not, it's not on that cycle. It's not going to be every year, but you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens. But you know, an interesting thing about the record is that it's with the albinism community. It's called white African power. Mm-hmm. And there was a lot of alarm and concern about the title, you know, like, like people are like, Oh my God, you know, what, you know, uh, and, uh, oh, right. you know, it, and, and it was like, well, I think that's, it was the title they chose. And I think that that's what great art does is that it gives people pause and, and creates dissonance oh, sure. and makes them think about the complexity of here's this group of people that are hunted and killed and raped because they are albino, that they have albinism mm-hmm. uh, in a society that skin whitening is an issue where people sometimes become ill or even overdose from skin whitening, trying to be lighter to supposedly look sure. better. But if you're too light, yep. you get killed, even though... Yeah, if it's, the, if it's a feature of your, uh, of your birth, <laughs> then it's, it's yes. unnatural. It's supernatural in case, you know, it turns into this... Yeah, and they're Tanzanian, but they're, but they're treated like outsiders. They're called white. It's, it's, it's a mess. And I, I think it just shows how stupid hatred is, meaning how it's based on ignorance and, and just not really thinking things through. And, and I, think the ti- I think the title is amazing because I think it, it gives people thought to think about, well, what, you know, what's the complexity? Because with the Malawi Mouse Boys, uh, you know, and also the good ones, uh, and also Acholi Machan and, and a lot of these different cultures, and also in Cambodia um, with the Khmer Rouge survivors, there's, there's always that class system. There's always the 1%. And I've seen people, Malawians, treat the Malawi Mouse Boys with such disdain, you know, yeah. in a way that would never, ever probably happen in the Western world unless it was somebody that was just an explicit, outright racist, um, you know. Yeah. Um, and, and yet it happens quite often in, in those situations. And I think that's the complexity, you know. And They've they've shared with me the Malawi Mouse Boys how bad they felt when that, when that's happened. You know when other Malawians have treated them that way, especially after they go to England and they play in front of ten thousand people and people are, are going ape shit. I mean, literally going crazy for a band without drums, without bass, with just four voices and hand percussion, rocking a crowd, pretty much harder than anybody I've ever seen, other than maybe. TV on the radio, Fugazi, Springsteen, and the replacements in their prime before Bob Stinson yes. died. You know, you know, and then they go home, and it's yeah. like it's like you guys aren't playing with the right instruments. You guys aren't playing in the right yeah. way. Yeah, they're punks. <laughs> <laughs> that's well, it. that's it's, you know, turns into, that's what we want: punk gospel. No, of course, DIY. that's it. It's just it's 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 new. You know, it's like it's yeah. That's just. Uh, well, on the Canada theme, uh, I, I, something happened to me recently that, that I never would have thought was possible. And that is that I was told that I was racist for not liking Celine Dion. I did not know that really? was possible. Yes. And, 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 and so I sent the person a, a thing from LA Weekly that was the top 20 whitest singers of all time. <laughs> and, and of course, Celine Dion is on that list because, uh, okay. you know, I, to me, that's always what she represented. But, it's, but uh, it's I, 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 I don't know. I, 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 I was more of 
it's trying to comment on the presentationalism of her singing. Sure, you know? sure, yeah. Child star presentational, you know, and that's the whole beef I have with Justin Timberlake. That's the beef I have with somebody like Drake is that I think it's really hard to get past the, that, the roots of that, you know, as child performers and get to a, a realer place. Um, it can happen, mm-hmm. but I think it's hard. And, and uh, I, I just don't believe a lot of pop singers, you know. And they, but, so, w- but what was their, <laughs> what, uh, <laughs> try to put together the puzzle of racist against Celine Dion. Um, it's, it's, a, it, it's a puzzle. I, I was really like, wow. Like, I just can do no right at that point. <laughs> that, I don't know. That's a, yeah, that's a... I, I just, I just, I'm just imagining Celine Dion as her own race. <laughs> so I'm just thinking, like, like she, well, I don't just think she's... Her. I think it's a cyborg thing. I think it's, yeah. uh, you know... A few of those other pop stars yeah. seem like they've been popped out of some, some Silicon Valley, probably pre-Silicon Valley uh, experiment. The early LSD pr- practitioners. Yeah, and you can get installed in, in Vegas for, for a few decades. <laughs> installed. It's a living hologram. Yeah. So when we were coming back uh, just yesterday from overseas and we landed at, um, at Burbank Airport, which I highly recommend if you're coming into Los Angeles to go to Burbank. Yes. Instead of Lakes. Yes. One of the humane airports for, left the, in the uh, world. Yeah. It's like the, it's the last days of Britney Spears' uh, Piece of Me show. Uh, uh, where, where she, I think she, I don't know if Celine Dion is still installed in Vegas, but Britney got installed. Installed. And I think installed. it's her. Because it's, I mean, I, it, you do, you get, in, you get installed. You get, your whole life moves to Vegas. I mean, I don't think she's, I, I, I mean, maybe you're flying to Vegas every night for a show, but I think they just set you up. Like they put you in one of the pyramids and you live there for 10 years. <laughs> one of the and play, you, come, you come downstairs and play the show in the gigantic <laughs> arena and then you go back upstairs right. to the mansion. And uh, right. yeah, if- so last, last days, but yeah, I always we kind of joke with the band sometimes just like, what song would we have to write to get installed in Vegas? Like, what would we have to do? Ah, uh, you know, people, maybe it, maybe it's people, coming. Maybe it's coming. Maybe but, you know. What's the magic button? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, you just you just haven't sold your soul yet. You you made that mistake. You you had your opportunity. You had your opportunity. You, missed you were in exit. with the gangsters. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't seize the day. <laughs> we kept our heads down and missed every exit. <laughs> ah. Damn you. Oh, man. You have an yeah. army of, of, you know, American pop idol uh, failures uh, that, that would have just killed to be in your place. Oh, my God. Literally. Uh, <laughs> literally, oh literally. God. Luckily, they didn't know. They didn't know what was transspiring what or was not transpiring. Out? Yeah. Oh, well, man. Yeah. So is there anything you want to you say in closing? In closing? Um, hey. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just looking. I'm looking forward to hearing the Albinism Collective project, and just wanted to say thanks for doing what you do. You know, because I don't. Uh. People can't. People aren't going to f- just find like we. Unfortunately, we're not. We're not there yet in um in our in our uh, human timeline where we can clap our hands and end up in another another town and another culture in front of their their. Uh, most earnest musicians so it's nice to, it's nice to be able to get it right right no thank you yeah, thank man. you for that it's totally my pleasure it's totally my honor it's totally thrilling uh you know it brings me back every time to being five years old and just you know hearing music that just just got me going like made me couldn't think about anything else couldn't do anything else and, and it's mm-hmm. so nice you know to be old and and still be taken back there occasionally by someone uh even though half the time i don't know what they're saying or singing but i can feel it and and it's yeah. it's such it's such a privilege it's such a thrill you know and music for me is just it's just such a beautiful thing it's just such a beautiful thing absolutely man thanks man yeah, absolutely so yeah. thank you <laughs> all right but okay <laughs> great talk with you all right take care take care bye Joke, we've won ya, Vilema, Vialo, 
Mugunjwa mazito bwana ya nani elemea I'll apply those words, such a beautiful thing, to this record, Tanzanian Albinism Collective. Again, listeners, check this record out. It's called White African Power. You're listening to one of the songs right now. It's out on Six Degrees Records. Absolutely one of my favorites of the year. Nick, thank you so much for joining me for today's podcast. Thank you for letting me sit in. This was a pleasure. Listeners, if you enjoyed today's talk, please head over to iTunes and Stitcher or wherever you pick us up and rate and review. Every time you do, it helps someone else find the podcast. And as Nick likes to say, an angel gets their wings. You can find us on Instagram, on Twitter, on Facebook. We have a great YouTube channel. We do, now featuring full episodes recorded at the Sono Store. Head there now to watch David Cross in conversation with Gene Gray and Fab Moretti of The Strokes, or TV on the radio's Kit Malone with the Yeah Yeah Yeah's Brian Chase and Meet Me in the Bathroom author Lizzie Goodman. And of course, we have a vibrant website where everyday artists are writing about film and music and all the issues around them. My name's Ellie Einhorn. I'm Nick Dawson. Today's talk was recorded by Tunde and Ian. And was mixed and co-produced by Mark Yoshizumi. Till next time. See you then. Aki, aki, aki